um, are on the developer track here in TechEd. They're a developer. They might be IT pro a little, but mostly developer. You're in the major ma minority. Major minority? You're, you know what I mean? You're in the minority. We need to stick together. All right, no kidding. All right, you got to eval the crap out of this presentation, all right? Because right now, if you could see where all the evals are, IT pros are all pushed to the top. And what's with you guys? You're like four people will eval an event? I mean, don't do that, all right? This one, kill it, right? We got to start blasting these babies all the way to the top so people can see that tech ed's about developers, too. All right, so I don't care what you vote. Just vote, right? Just, you know, the, the quantity is what matters. Only a handful of development ones. My, my session yesterday, were very many of you in my session yesterday? Gosh, all of you. So um, uh, that one did great, right? But it's like the only one in the uh, rating. So don't not do it, right? Don't not do it. Just you, you all have the TechEd app. You all know how to go and fill out your survey, right? The TechEd app doesn't work anymore. Well, that blows. Now I don't know what to tell you. Somebody give me a solution. Is there a solution? Is there a website you can go to instead? You have to use the machines and the vegetables to do it. The machines and the vegetables will do it. All right, so that will, uh, that will take you one minute, right? It's totally worth it. Don't not do it. Come on. If half of you do it, don't not half. If all of you do it, it'll be unbelievable, right? It'll, frankly, that will explode the system. It'll probably crash. It's running on Azure, so it'll be all right. But it'll be serious. Don't not do the eval. Here we go. Um, I got a lot to talk about today. Uh, Prism is what we're going to talk about specifically for Windows Store apps. Um, because I asked you all this yesterday, I don't need to ask you the same question again, but I'll ask you this. How many people have ever gone file new project Windows Store project? All right, about half of you. And how many of you have said, have published that app to the store? All right, about 16 of you, I would say. No problem, right? It's, it's a burgeoning technology. There's no reason that uh, you wouldn't jump in now. Now the momentum's finally coming into it, right? And so when you start building an application for the Windows Store, you'll see there are a lot of gaps, not technology gaps, but guidance gaps, like what do we do now? That's what this session is about. How to solve problems in a consistent way. I'm gonna show you how to solve a whole bunch of problems really fast. You can solve them your own way. That's not what I'm telling you today. What I'm gonna tell you today is, I'm gonna solve these problems for you this way. If you go my way, it's gonna work. If you go your way, it's gonna work too. But at least now you can have some guidance. And it also allows us to have consistency across the applications. Okay, so specifically around Prism. So my name's Jerry Nixon. For those of you who don't know, I'm a developer evangelist from the United States. I work for Microsoft. I live in Colorado. And uh, I'm at, at Jerry Nixon is my, uh, my Twitter handle. A whole slew of you took a picture and put it on Twitter last night. My wife was tickled. That was just really the best thing you could have done. Thank you. Um, the uh, at JerryNixon.com is my blog you can go to. Here's what we'll talk about. We might as well just start talking about it instead. The, uh, I mean, I have 77 slides in 75 minutes, so it's going to be tough. And I, you guys know how fast I type. So how did we get here? Let's just talk about Prism. So Prism is not the Prism for WPF, right? There are two Prisms in the world now. They're both made by Patterns and Practices, part of Microsoft. The first one is made for WPF. That's the green line. The green line shows how Prism for WPF has progressed all the way back from 2008 to, to 2014 when Prism 5.0 is released right now. So it's a very rich and composable app, complicated a little bit, right? But still very, very rich. Totally doesn't apply to a store application. The paradigms are different. The lightweightness of the store apps is a big deal. That blue line kind of shows the reusable parts between the two systems. And so we in introduced Unity a long, long time ago. So Unity is that dependency injection and version of control tooling. And then we in introduced PubSub events for that aggregated central event handling. And then we have MVVM, and that's just all the base classes and stuff that you want when you're doing the MVVM pattern, which we all know is what you want to do inside XAML because it gives you a consistent pattern between all XAML projects because we all use uh, MVVM. And of course, MVVM was invented. It's based off MVC, but it was basically invented by the WPF team. And there's a lot of tooling inside of Visual Studio and the XAML framework to give you MVVM. 
But this orange is what we're talking about today. We're talking about, so first Prism for the Windows runtime was released. That's because we didn't have any kind of consistency yet with the Windows Phone. Along came Windows Phone 8.1, so along came Prism for Universal Apps. That's one Prism for both the phone and for the Windows application you're going to create inside a Universal application. All right, so what is Prism very quickly? Prism is developer guidance. That's all that it is. It gets you a bunch of nice candy, right? It's a super duper lightweight MVVM framework. It is not MVVM Lite, which by the way is awesome, right? If you like MVVM Lite, I'm not telling you to change. It's still fantastic. You can use all of these as friends with each other or you can just go pure uh, Prism and get the same sort of benefit that MVVM Lite gives you today. It also includes a whole bunch of candy just for the Windows Store that nothing else gives you. This is really what we're gonna talk about today. We'll talk about very quickly the MVVM side, but, um, but more we're gonna talk about Windows Store and what you get from there. All right, so uh, there's other stuff too, but we'll talk about all of it. It's better that we just start from a very, very simple example. If you haven't created, all, most of you have created at least the initial project, file new project, hit F5 and it runs, right? So that's basically what I'm going to do for you and I'll just show you the slight changes between it. There's a problem that's being solved all the time. The default, the default template, so what's the problem? The default template that comes in Visual Studio is quite complex. Even the blank is quite complex. And we'll, I'll show you kind of how that all lays out and why it's a problem. You get a lot of the benefit now from Prism. It inherits um, MVVM app base on your application. I'll show you the default application that ships out of the box. It's crazy how big it is and all this, comp all this stuff that's easy to get wrong. This solves that problem for you very, very quickly. That's only because of MVVM app base. Right, so basically I'm replacing the application with MVVM app base, which is an encapsulation of all the code that's there already, and, and including some other kind of magical stuff that makes some more stuff work for us. All right, so what's the problem? Navigating means you have to have the type of everything, right? And so this is really a problem. If you look at how navigation works today, right now I have to know the specific type. Now if I navigate to something and it's not inside the scope of wherever it is that I'm currently in, let's say my view, view model needs to navigate to another view model or, or whatever, whatever it needs to do, that type now is always tightly coupled to whoever's trying to navigate it. That's another problem that we're solving with Prism and we solve it with the idea of experiences. And so here's an example of the main experience. So I call out to, instead of navigating to a type, I navigate to main, it's just a string I could write this so that it's not a literal, so I could use an enumeration if I wanted to as well. In fact, that's what I actually do when I use this in my own projects. But at its heart, it just takes a string, and I say main, and it does all based on conventions, just like MVC and ASP.NET. Using conventions, it tries to find all the, both the view and the view model based on types that it inherits, as well as the naming convention that you'll use. And I'll walk you through all of that to make sure that you see it. Okay, so this is the main experience. So look at it at the bottom. We create the main experience, but inside the view model namespace, I create the main page view model, right? That's how it knows to find the main view model because that's the name convention that I use. I make sure that it implement, or inherits from view model, which is given to me by Prism. Also over here in the views namespace, I create the main page. That's the convention that it finds the page or the view that it's looking for, and I make sure that it inherits from iView. If I don't like this naming convention, by the way, I can change it. In fact, almost everything inside Prism can be changed. This is how it works right out of the box. The, uh, let's see here. Okay, so here I am. I'm navigating to main, but you can see that down in my views namespace, I have my main page, and then down in my view models namespace, I have my main page view model. From this point forward, the convention handles everything. I just put things in the right place and kind of go from there. Uh, Okay, so let me show you a quick hello world here. I'm gonna create a blank uh, universal app. All three projects are there, the phone, Windows, and shared. Right now, out of the box, it's gonna ship with uh, main page in the top two head projects. Might as well include, through NuGet right now, the uh, prism.store apps. So I'll accept it, and I'll install it, and it's important that I have this on both of them, but it's, it's uh, universal, so it's completely safe. All right, so this is that um, app XAML. See how big and long and complicated it is? All these things that are just waiting for you to change and break. So instead of doing it that way, we don't inherit from application anymore. 
we inherit from MVVM app base. All we have to do is initialize the component, and there's only one other requirement, not, the initial, not this on initialize, which is handy for me to have, but what really is important is that I also have the on, on launch. So this is a task, so I can do things awaited, and I can do long running tasks here that I wouldn't be able to do in the normal implementation. All right, so look, right here I'm going to make sure that the base is the same. Remember, I changed it in the code behind, but I also need to change it inside the XAML, otherwise it's not going to work. So in my views folder, that's going to automatic, automatically put things inside the views namespace. I'll create a, a, a main page, and just for the sake of making it easy to see, I'll say hello Barcelona here on, in the hub. So now that's all that I'm going to do. Inside that launch is where I'm going to navigate to main. Remember, it's just a string. Because I called it main page in the views namespace, it'll work automatically for me. So when I run it, hello Barcelona, and everything works right out of the box. That is as hello world as you can get. It is all that I do is overwrite everything that comes out of the box as far as the app XAML CS application so that it uses, um, so that it uses MVVM app base. And I put, every, uh, put my views, starting to put all my views up into the views namespace where I know that they belong. That makes sense? Everybody follow along? Do I type fast enough for you? OK. Um, another problem is around the idea of data. What is the problem? Data access code is repeated everywhere. And so every view model that I have interacts with something, my service, my REST service, whatever it is, my file system, and it's repetitive over and over again. How am I going to make sure that I access data in a way that's extremely consistent from every single piece, but also allows me to create, to fix a problem or implement additional features without having to go to every single one. So every time I talk to the file system, I want to make sure this happens. But I do it six different places. So that's what the data, pa the data repository pattern allows me to do. So this is the data repository pattern where it fixes this. The, the simplicity of getting it wrong, right? It fixes that. The simplicity of being inconsistent, it fixes that as well. And now it's a lot easier to fix, a lot easier to test, enhance, and maintain. Maintenance of your code is probably the, what should be in the forefront of your mind every time you design. You as an architect, right, we don't architect things, right, that's not a verb, we design things as architects. And so when I'm designing something as an architect, there are two things that are important. Sometimes your architecture is the only documentation a developer will ever receive. That's just real life. And if you have just a mismatch of architecture that makes no sense, that basically means you have no documentation for your application. That's one of the reasons we try to avoid technical debt at the beginning, right? So we can document our code by using a consistent architecture throughout our entire project. The second reason is because there's a second reason, but I've completely lost it. Sorry. <laughs> I'll come back to it if I can. The, uh, all right, so this is the way that it looks, right? I create a model, let's say it's just of an item, whatever that is. It's in the items, the model's namespace. And then I'll create an interface's namespace, or maybe you won't, maybe you put them somewhere else, but you create an I items repository. From that point forward, you define exactly the way your repository works. Does it have an update, select, delete, get all, get one, whatever it is you have, you can have it as unique as you want. It doesn't need to be universal, it doesn't need to apply to every type. It can be very specific to just this item, right? And then inside the repository is your concrete class that implements that interface. So I have item repository, which of course, let's see, in, inherit or implements I item repository. Right? This allows me to create two, by the way. I could create another item repository that I might use in my unit test, or I might use whenever I'm offline, or I might use whenever I'm at design time, right? Those are all real scenarios, but because I have I item repository already defined in, as an interface, I can create as many of those as I need and just pass them around. In just a minute, we'll talk about how dependency injection works. But um, for now, it's not very important. This is just the idea of if you start with an interface, life is just easy in the long run. So what happens is now I have five view models. They all go around a single data repository. That's important for me because now when I need to fix an error that I have, I need to add authentication or I need to add encryption, no problem. I'll go do it inside my repository, and from that point forward, all the view models get the benefit from it. Right? So that's important for me. Let's take a look at how to build this out. I'll do this real quickly. Try not to take a long time this time. The, uh, only kidding. Let's see. No, no, no. I'm, I'm totally serious. The, um, let's see here. I will uh, create a models folder, and we'll go through the same scenario as before. I'll create an item class in my model, 
It's going to have three quick properties, a text property, a color property, which is just a standard color, but I'll also use a solid color bay, a solid color brush, which of course is a type from XAML. I'll use that a little bit later. I'll just make it get and return an instantiated solid color brush from the actual class. Now it's time for the repository. I'm going to put them in the repository's uh, namespace, but you can put it wherever you want. Here's my item repository, and I'll build it out really before I do my uh, interface. So just a single method of get items. Just a single method of all items, right? And so here it's going to be simple enough that I'll just reflect into all the colors that are defined inside the framework. Uh, I, obviously, you would go out to a web service or something like that instead. So in this type, I'll just go get all the properties inside the colors class, which return color, and I'll recast them or project them all into a models.item, setting its text to whatever that property name is, which is the color, and setting the color to whatever the value is of that property. So I can just infer now whatever this interface is, right? Put an I in front of it, and I'm good to go. And I'll make sure that it inherits from it and implements this one or defines this one method of all items. Now I have my repository as well as my interface for my repository, and they're ready to go. That's as simple as it gets. It shouldn't get much complicated, more complicated for you either. You would add another method and maybe another method below that. And then from there, it's whatever it has to do with for your scenario. Do you use SQLite in order to store all of your data? Do it right here. Do you in interact with a REST service, a web API, whatever it is? Do it right here. Just make sure you have your interface as well. This is the repository pattern as simple as it can get. And we'll use it again in just a second. All right. The idea of model view, view model is, are the three components. And if it were me, and, and I'm not in charge, but if I were, it would be called view, view model, model, which doesn't flow quite as easily, but we'd all be used to it by now, so it actually would. And the reality is the view is where your UI or XAML is defined. And then the view model is the class you create special, not the code behind that is, that is meant to service your view. But the view model is really meant to project your data up into your view. right? So I have a view in the view model. But then I also have the model, which may represent the records in your database, or it may represent files on your file system, or whatever it is that you have, the JSON that comes back and gets deserialized into a class. All right, so we have view, view model, and model. This is where we want to kind of go to. The problem is, uh, Prism, the problem is, without Prism, we have all this stuff in the framework, but it's not totally complete. All right, so we have. Uh, prism.mvvm. This is the namespace that gives us all the implementations that we want. The first is bindable base. It's going to inherit from I notify property change. We got bindable base in the original templates that came with Visual Studio win for Windows 8.0, but then they took them out, right? So we all end up writing our own bindable base abstract class that everything inherits from, just so we don't have to implement I notify property change over and over again. This is one of the base classes that comes from Prism for us, right? Again, not a lot comes from Prism, just the basics of what you need. It's super lightweight. The next thing you get is a view model, which is basically the base class for all of your view models. It inherits from bindable base as well, which of course all of our view models are going to want as well. Um, then we get the delegate command. So I command is already part of the XAML framework, and we already implement our own delegate command, or sometimes it's the relay command, but they're all the same thing. They're just, just um, uh, concrete implementations of the I command interface and uh, of the I command interface. Then there's also an I view. And an I view is a simple interface that's given to us by Prism, and it's used later just to identify where our views are. So if I have a page that I'm creating, I make sure it implements I view. What methods, what properties, what events are in I view? Absolutely nothing. It's only used to identify where my views are. So it's a very easy interface to implement. All right, so here's bindable, bindable base and the way I would use it. See, there's my class that I just created, item. It inherits from bindable base. And there inside, I can call set property. And remember, it has that built-in calling, uh, calling member name. So calling member name already pulls out the name. It used to be in XAML development, we had to type in a literal string of whatever it was that our property was that what we were raising I notify property change for. Thank goodness those days are finally behind us. And we don't have to worry about that literal string. And if I rename the property, then the literal string doesn't rename and all kinds of problems there. That's bindable base. We also have view model base. Nothing to it. You just get view model right there. Nothing I have to implement in order to make it work. But it does give me a few virtual methods uh, in the base class if I want the uh, on navigated to and on navigated from, both of which we'll talk about here in just a second. 
So here's PageBase. I created a, a class called PageBase. It, imp it in implements iView. Remember, there's nothing to iView, but from this point forward, as you can see in the bottom one, all my main page now will implement, will inherit from PageBase instead of the standard base that usually it, it has right out of the box. That means I have two steps whenever I create a page now. I have to change its base class and then go into its XAML and change its base class there as well, right? Just like I did in the uh, app in the uh, app XAML CS in the first demo. And then there's delegate command or relay command, but it's called delegate command inside Prism. I, it's an impl base implementation of I command and it allows you to have all of your property, your command properties inside your view model so that your view can invoke actions in your view model, right? That's the communication method to go into your view model from your view. And it's, 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 it's simple implementation. This is my, the way I do it. You might do it slightly different. The reality is it's just a delegate command. It works the way you, exactly the way you would expect, both typed and untyped, by the way. All right, so what's the problem? A view must reference a view model type. The, a view must reference its view model type. Every time I go into a view and I create it, what view model is it going to use? Well, the reality is the view model could shift depending on what the scenario is. I may have a view model that's specific for unit testing or a view model that's specific for um, online, offline, one for an administrator. Depending on how I write my logic, I might actually have them in separate assemblies as well. That's totally all right, but that becomes a really big problem. Inside my view, in order to make a reference to what the data context is, I have to know that type. I don't have to know that type if it auto wires up for me, but it doesn't auto wire up unless I have Prism. So thanks to Prism now, I can, I can auto wire up, in fact, those are the scenarios, I can auto wire up like this. So that's my page, right? And I've changed this base class and I make a, a namespace reference to Prism. So I say using Microsoft pr practices, Prism and VVM, that gives me an attached property of auto wire up view model as true. From there, it uses the same naming conventions that I used before to go and find the view model that belongs to this view and just set its data context. The end. Nothing very special really about it. Just does the work for me. If, I, if the logic that I have to go find my uh, view model, it will all be centralized somewhere. If, I don't, if right out of the box I want to change it so that it looks in a special assembly or it does something based on some sort of logic, great. I do it in a central place and from that point forward, all my views find their view models in another way, all because they're auto-wired up for me. No longer do I have to have a hard reference into, uh, into my view model from my view. All right, so what's the problem? It's inconsistent how I can get design time data. Design time data is a big deal inside XAML, not only because I want to see it in Blend or the designer in Visual Studio, but because that's the way I do, I lay things out properly, right? It could take me five seconds to build, deploy, and then navigate into my application to a scenario I'm trying to tweak just right. I need design time data in order to see it the way I want to see it during the designer, or while I'm inside the designer. So, how do I handle that? Well, we do it all with interfaces, right? That's where we want to start. So I create iPageViewModel. That's my interface for my view model. And then I make sure that inside my view model, I inherit um, inside view models uh, namespace, I inherit from iPageViewModel when I create my main page view model. That seems simple enough, but then it allows me to create a design time namespace. And then in there, I can create my own main page view model and I can have totally different logic. Because over in view models where it's really runtime, I can do all kinds of things like an asynchronous call to a web service. But over here in design time, I'm very limited because design time doesn't support everything. In fact, it doesn't support much. I can't read from a file. I can't call from, to a service. I have to really build everything right in the constructor. But it allows me to create sample data really easily. And this allows me just to have a pattern of where to put all of my namespaces. And I'll show you here in just a second when we do a demo. The <coughs> um, all right, so in fact, this is, uh, this is going to be a, uh, this will be a quick one where let's just add the view model so that we can see two of them, right? So the first thing I'll add is the interface necessary for the uh, main page view model. I'll infer it after I build it. Remember, inherit from view model so that it can find it, but also so that you can have all of the virtual properties that it has. So I'll create one property, or virtual methods. So I'll create one property called items. That's an observable collection because this is a XAML application. And then on navigated to, which is important because usually we only get on navigated to on the page level, which is a real pain. 
So I can do everything asynchronously here if I want to because it's no longer in the constructor. So in this case I'll use a repository that we created in the last demo, get all of its items and just add them to that collection. Now I can infer what this interface is. It's very, very simplistic. I main page view model and I'll make sure that uh, it includes the uh, items class here or the uh, items property and it's just the getter that I need although I could implement a setter and it wouldn't matter because it's just an interface. All right. So let me add another folder now. We have our view model. I'm going to create a design time view model. So that one was for runtime. I would have logic there that calls into my service or whatever. This one is going to be for uh, design time. And so I need to inherit from the same main page view model. I want to make sure they look exactly the same so that I have a consistent experience at design time. But now I do all the logic instead of on navigated to, I'll do all the logic inside the constructor. Right? And so I'll have the same logic here just because this is a demo, but here you would do things that don't violate the design time rules like asynchronous calls. Right? So now I have a simple view model uh, on for both. Now, let's add that prism namespace inside my main page. Right? It's just a reference to the prism.mvvm namespace, but then I can say view model locator auto wire up is true. From that point forward, everything's sort of handled for me. Now, I'm going to create a common folder and inside it a quick class that implements the base. Remember, we want all of our pages to inherit or to implement iView. So I'll create iView here and I don't really need to do anything else unless you have something custom you want to do in all of your pages. Now I can go back to main page and I'm going to make that change so that it implements it for me. So I'm going to make a reference. It's up in common. So I'll make a namespace reference to the com or I'll make a XML namespace to the common namespace. So common page base. Now it inherits from it and I make, need to go into the code behind to make sure it inherits from the same thing as well. So now I've implemented iView as well as created the design time and the runtime view model. Now I'll reference the design time view model, but I don't want to actually set the data context. I want to set the design time data context with the D colon, right? The D colon will be ignored when I go into, uh, when I go into runtime and it compiles. So uh, I don't want to forget to new up my observable collection. And now, just so you can see that I have data, remember it's pulling back all of the colors. I'll just add a data template inside my hub section, or I'm sorry, I'll add a grid view inside my hub section that shows everything. I've already bound it to the items. You can see it's trying to bind for me. And I'll just give it a quick look here. I'll use the uh, uh, 150 by 150 grid and bind its background to that brush that's inferred from the color, right? So now I have design time data while I'm inside Visual Studio. That's what I want, right? I want to see what it's going to look like so I can make it a little bit bigger, make it a little bit smaller and be happy, happier either way. The other thing I'll change is to make sure that the item selected, so as the user comes in and selects one, I want to make sure and bind this to a selected property and make its mode two-way, both so I can set it from code behind, but also so that the UI can write back to the code for me as well. Right, so I don't have a property called selected, so I'm going to go in and create a quick property of type models.item that is selected, and then I'll create a quick one here. That prop note, by the way, is just a, uh, is just a, a snippet I use to get things done fast, right? And so just like you use prop, I created one called prop note like you could too. And so this is the one for the design time. I'm not going to use it. Hang on just a second. I'm not going to use this one, but I need it to be there in order to implement iMain page view model properly. Right? So here I am, I'm running it, and I have the same experience because I'm using the same code. But in your project, you probably won't use the same code in your design time view model as you do in your runtime. But I did. So this is, what, this is the solution to a whole bunch of things at once. I have a base to my view model, I have an, impl I have an interface for my view, and I also solve the, the problem of. Um, of design time data as well, with just a consistent way of doing it. You guys might have a different way, by the way. And it's not wrong just because you do. This is just a way to solve it that's easy and it works. And this, if you don't have a way, then this is the way you should do it, right? That's kind of the way guidance works. It's not really meant to hold you down and beat you up if you get it wrong. It's really just meant to give you a starting place unless you have a better reason to, right? All right. <coughs> so now we have another issue. 
When I create a universal app, I'm really creating two applications with two unique binaries, one that's going to be built for the phone and one that's going to be built for Windows, right? And the reality is only about 90% of those are going to overlap. So just imagine a Venn diagram and the two crescent moons on the outside are what we have to deal with. And there's lots of different situations where that's going to be. Maybe the status bar on the phone, which doesn't show up on Windows and you want to interact with it. How do you handle all those pieces of code like that? The problem is Windows and phone, they are not identical. The solution are lots, right? But here are the two most common ones. The first one you can solve just with styling. So I have a, I have a button that I don't want to show up when I'm on Windows, but I do want it to show up when I'm on phone. Great. I can do it just like this. I can put platform specific styles into the one into the Windows and a copy of it into the phone head projects. I can swap their values like this so that in Windows, visible on phone is collapsed. That means anything that's visible on phone when you're in Windows is not visible, right? And I could switch it down here on phone. Visible on phone is visible. That means now I'm on the phone, that same, uh, that same XAML control is going to be visible, right? So I can go back and forth. This is a no-brainer way of solving a problem whenever you have XAML elements that you don't want to show up on different projects. Uh, on different uh, platforms. Another way might be visual states. I mean, if you have major things that are changing, you're probably going to use the visual state to do it. Another way to do it is with compiler directives. So a compiler directives are your way of talking directly to a, directly to the compiler itself and saying, do not include this in my project, right? And so if I were, in fact, let me show you something real quick. I'm going to swap, oh, there we go. I'm going to swap over to uh, the correct one this time and show you, oh. I want to show this, uh, if I were inside, the, here's the Windows Phone project, and if I go to its properties and its build tab over here, you can see the Windows underscore phone underscore app is predefined for me that's out of the box. The same thing is going to happen if I go over to the Windows project and its build tab. You can see Windows underscore app, not the phone, just Windows underscore app. That's the way I can determine the two between. I can create my own custom ones if I needed to, but these are straight out of the box, so I don't have to think about it that way. How do you implement those? With those pound ifs, I can say pound if Windows underscore app. That means not phone, basically, right? Or any project that actually defines that variable. So now I can have this entire piece, which in this case is getting the settings charm logic finished, right? That settings charm logic has nothing to do with the phone, so it doesn't belong in the phone. And then down here I can have an LF, you don't have to have that, but I have an LF for Windows underscore phone underscore app with nothing, right? And one interesting thing, you can see it's grayed out. That's because Visual Studio does that for me. Whenever I'm not in the context of one head or the other, it grays it out inside the tooling. It's just a nice little, little thing that it does. All right. So, again, it's those two uh, keywords that are predefined for you inside the project so you don't have to think about it. All right, so some basic MVVM implementation. All right, let's see. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> All right. Um, <coughs> so, we're going to start by creating the views that we need in the head projects. So, right now I'm in the, win the, uh, the Windows project and I'll create the about page as a settings flyout. There's no such thing as a settings flyout in the phone page. So here I am in the phones project. I'm just going to create a page called about page. And I'll change it so that it's a hub and just says about so when we navigate to it, you can see that it's about. So this, again, this is not the about page for Windows. That wouldn't make sense. So now I have to implement platform specific pieces. And part of how I'll do that is creating a resource dictionary inside the phone project. So again, I'm inside the head project, not shared code. So I'll create, just like I showed you in, in the slide, I'll create this visibility that says visible when phone. And I'll do the same thing for visible when Windows. And all I have to do is make sure that when I copy this up into the Windows project, I, don't, I just swap those value, values um, around. Right? So look, visible when phone is visible. That's because I'm in the, the Windows project. Now, I just copied this by dragging it up into the Windows head, and I'll just swap those two around so that it's collapsed, right? So that phone is collapsed in a Windows project. Inside, blend is the easiest way to do uh, complex XAML around resources. So all I'm going to do is make a reference to the platform XAML that we just created inside App XAML, and then go back to Visual Studio. So this is the code that it added for me, easy enough, and it just references platform XAML, which is in both heads, so I could rely on it being there in every situation. All right, so to make this work, I'm going to use a delegate command. And uh, this will launch the about 
this will launch the about page, but in all reality, this is only going to be for the phone because to launch the about page on Windows will be through a, ch a charms gesture. So I, this is my delegate command snippet. You can create your own. It creates an about command that almost matches exactly the, uh, the slide that I showed you. That's the implementation for, uh, this is the beginning of the implementation for phone. So app, now, app is the, my local app. I need to create a static property, a static field will make it, that, um, ref, that can have, act, give me access to the navigation service in all my sub pages and my view models, right? And we'll talk about injection later and how you can handle that. So now nav service is a public static property in app. So I could say app.navservice, and from there I could call navigate like normal. And remember, it takes a string, and I'm going to navigate to about. It, this isn't uh, compile time checked, so even if I hadn't created about, it would still work. That's the implementation for the runtime uh, view model. This is the, uh, that's the implementation for the design time view model. Easy enough. But let's make it so that there's a button to actually go to. You're going to need to click something to implement that will actually call out to that. So I'll create a command bar. It'll create two primary buttons for me by default, and I'll delete the first one. I'll change it so that its label says about, and I'll change it so it has the more icon, I'm sure. And um, uh, I'll, I'll bind its command now to that about command that we just created. I don't want this to show up for Windows, by the way, because there is no page in Windows for this. So I'll, I'll set its visibility to visible when phone. And I know that I've already set those up in the, in the two platform XAMLs, so I don't have to worry about whether or not that works. Also make it easy for me to make sure that that's open. Look at, I'm, I can't see the button on the command bar. Let me swap over to the phone, and you can see the buttons right there. The, uh, the designer can swap between the two and then obey the different heads as well. All right, so that's the implementation for phone. Let's do the implementation now for Windows. So I'll switch its context in the, from the context switcher, and I'll override uh, get settings. So this is given to me by Prism to handle everything in a single place. And so I'll create a, a settings command. So that little line that shows up in the charms is, is basically a settings command. I'm going to make it say about. And when you click it, it's going to invoke this uh, delegate for me, this anonymous delegate. Uh, it's, re it's requesting an I list, so I'll return it as, a, as an array. Because you can have more than one, of course. Uh, so in this case, I'm not going to navigate at all. I'm just going to create a new one and say show independent, because that's how uh, settings flyouts work. I don't want this. This will fail, by the way, if I try and run this on phone or try and build it. So I'll make sure that it doesn't um, get compiled when it goes to phone by using the command directive of Windows underscore app. So here I am. You can see it goes over to lorem ipsum, right? It gives me the, my about. Now let me swap over so that I'm using it from phone instead of from Windows. And you'll see it in order to get to about, hang on, there you go. In order to get to about, I'll, there's a button visible now that if I click it, it navigates me to the about page. Remember, this isn't about page, not the about uh, flyout. There's two different ones, each defined independently in the two different heads because they work differently depending on which type of platform that you're on. That's how to handle the two most common ways and easily the simplest um, ways of handling platform dependent code. All right, so now I need a second page and there's gonna be a whole bunch of issues around having a second page. Uh, the first problem is there's no way to pass information from the first page to the second page. This is really a bummer because you call the base navigation service. This is the, uh, let me see. I want to show the base navigation service goes ahead and takes a variable, but it passes it to the page. Then how does it get from the page up to the view model? It's a real pain. That's the reason we use the navigation service from Prism. Prism solves this problem by adding an on navigated to as well as an on navigated from to your view model, which means the values that I pass in navigation now pass directly to your view model just like they do to your page so, or to your view, right? So both get them, but you can use them in either place now. More than likely, you're going to use them in your view model instead. More and more I saw developers before this came around, developers just create a quick handler inside their code behind, find their view model, cast their view model, and set some property or call some method in their view model. It's not bad, right? But it's needless. Now this solves it in a consistent way by giving on navigated to inside your view model and passing your parameter for you. In fact, it looks like this. This is my view model. You can see I inherit from view model, which is what gives me the ability to override on navigated to. It gives me three properties or parameters, actually. The first is the parameter that, that is passed in, 
right? The next one is the mode, whether, whether or not the page is being refreshed and all kinds of things that I might need to act differently on, and also whether or not there's a state coming in, and that state allows me to handle a restore state. And we'll talk about that here in just a second, because restore state is handled for you by Prism as well, but you can do it manually if you're really into it. All right, so we also have navigated from, which really the only thing great about navigated from is I can detect whether or not I'm suspending. That means I don't have to attach to the suspending event anymore, which is great. The fewer events you attach to, the better. In fact, try not to attach to an event ever. That's just real. All right. So the parameter is the big deal. Let's try and build out a quick sub, uh, sub page so that we can see the details. So we're going to start with the view model, because that's where I like to start. This will be the detail page view model, right? And so I'll inherit from um, uh, view model. So I can have all of the uh, virtual methods in its base that I want. But I'll just start with a really simple models.item. Right? That's going to be what I'm going to show a detail of. But now, in order to use that, I'm going to make sure that I use the onNavigated2 instead. Right? So I, because I'll be in a sub page, I want to give myself a way to go back. I'll create a go back command. That's a delegate command that's given to me by Prism as well. Remember, app.navservice is exposed as a public static so I can access it all that I want. So now I'll just build out what the interface is going to look like. It's going to grow over time, of course. The, uh, I know that I've got a command, and I know that I've got this item as well, and it, I know that you don't do public in an interface. All right, so now I have my interface built, and I know that it inherits the way it's supposed to, and perfect. Now that's runtime. Let's go out and build the exact same thing for design time. We need almost no, no inf we almost need no implementation to make this work. So we'll just make this a quick uh, getter and setter, and we'll do the same thing for the command as well. Right? Now, I'm going to use the constructor to do all the work, because that's what's executed by the designer at design time. So I'll use the repository. I'll set the item to uh, just the first one in the list. Right? Is that a super way to do it? I don't know. I need li link in order to use first. But that's the way we're going to do it for this demo. How am I going to get the data, though, inside my runtime view model? I'm going to use onNavigated2, which I can trust will actually be executed. So the first thing I'll look is to see whether or not the view model state that's passed in has anything in it. Because if it is, that means I'm trying to be restored. So really, I want to say is does not have anything in it. And if it doesn't, then I'll go ahead and create that repository. This is going to be my runtime repository, whatever that would be for you. And here I'll just set the item, and I'll use the same logic. I'll just get them all and ask for the first one. But in this time, I, I don't want a random one. I want to match the one that the user is going to pass in. So I'll assume the navigation parameter is the text of the color in this case. right? So now I don't have any way to see it, so I'll create a blank page called detailed page. right? This is just going to be very simple XAML for us. I know that it has to inherit from our, uh, from our page base here, and I also need to do that over in the XAML as well. I'll make a reference to uh, the common namespace and change its base class now to be page base. Now, that's set up so it implements iView. The next thing I want to do is make sure I wire up my view model correctly. So I'll just say auto wire up is true. And I'll make a reference to my design time view model. And now I'm done, right? I want to set the data context using d colon. So this is only in the design time. Now I need a little bit of uh, UI here. So I'll use a hub because it lays everything, else, everything out nicely. I'll bind the background of the first section to the items brush. I'll bind the, uh, the header of the first section to the color name. And then let's add a text box so that we can pretend like we can edit the text of the color name. Right? So here's a simple text box. Because it's a text box, I'll make sure its mode is two-way. And I'll update it on property change so it's as I type, not when it loses the focus. I don't know if that makes sense or not. Yeah. And a uh, quick little title here. So that's the color name that I'd be editing. Now, I want to add a way to go back. And the way that we go back is with a quick button. So I'll add a stack panel in the header. So I'll use the uh, app bar button. I'll line it down to the bottom and set its icon to back. And then bind its command, bind its command to the go back command in my view model. Done. Now when the user clicks that, uh, it will navigate back to the main page for them. I'll create a, just a nice little header here that shows the color as well. Now, that's not set up right. That's the hub section. Um, I'm going to move that header out of the hub section and up to the hub so it's nice and big and kind of looks cool. So there's the hub. There you go. So it looks, this is a little more what it should actually look like. 
and uh, lays it out a little more. So that's my detail page and my main page. There's still no way to get to the detail page from my main page. So I'll create a delegate command called open command. And the implementation, I'll use my uh, snippet to do it. And inside the implementation, all I'm going to say is use the navigation service to navigate the detail, but I'm going to pass in the selected text. This allows me to pass a parameter directly into the view model of the next page. Right, so that's important. I'll make sure this command is not enabled unless something is selected. Then I don't have to worry about it. So I'll uh, add that open command, which really doesn't need any implementation at runtime, but it has to be there because of the interface. <coughs> OK, so now let's add a button so that we can invoke that command. I'll add another button then down in our primary controls here. And you can see there's, it looks like there's only one because the other one is hidden from the Windows project. Right? We'll make it open, and I'll bind it really quickly to the open command that we just created in our view model. That's the full implementation. All the logic on whether or not it's enabled or not is in the view model. You can see it's disabled by default. I'll make a selection, and now it's enabled, and now it navigates me over to Cyan. Right, it's easy enough, right? It seems so simple. Let's try the same thing now inside Windows Phone. I'll run it in the emulator. And so I'll select an item. You can see the button enables itself automatically because that's what I command does. And then it takes me to it the way you would hope. And it makes itself look the way it's supposed to look per platform, right? Because the controls handle that for me. So I can use that hub control and always trust that it's going to look correct. All right. So when you add a page, these are the only steps you need to remember in order to maintain the consistency across your project. Right, so the first is to create the view model, which needs an interface and two versions. The runtime version, which is the full version you already create today, and then create a design time version, which may have almost nothing, right? Just enough in order to be able to see that your bindings are correct. Then create your view, which you need to change its base page to whatever its base that inherits from iView, right? Whatever. And then wire up the view model automatically. That's that prism auto wire up, and then uh, do that D colon data context so that you can have a design time view model as well. Done. All those six steps and you're finished every step you go through and you can rely on all of it to have a rich experience for you as the developer as well as the full consistency across all of your projects. Great. Now we have another problem of handling state. What's the problem? The app can be terminated at any time. This is not like a WPF application. WPF applications cannot be terminated at any time. I can stop the user from clicking. I can sniff to see if, this, if the process is trying to be terminated and create another one. There's all kinds of things that I can do to make it so that the user has a really, really hard time canceling, terminating my app. That's not the way it works in the store. For store apps, the, the, uh, they, all they have to do is load another app. And as soon as my app is on the back, background, my app is now suspended and could be terminated at any time, and I can't control it. Right? It could be terminated just because the user restarts. It could be re terminated because the user, the next app up, uses so much memory that there's no memory in the system, and the, and the operating system automatically terminates my app. Now I have to handle that. Right? This is the life cycle. It starts from running, goes over to suspending, right? and then goes to not running. It could, that not running is the terminated state. I have to figure out what to do when it goes to terminated, and I have to handle it. There's a lot of logic to, to kind of go through all this and make sure that I persist and give the user a nice experience. So what's the problem? When the user returns, when the user returns, so again, if this is just swapped in memory, I don't have to do anything. Right? Just real quick, the user goes and checks their email, comes right back. The operating system does everything for me. This is if my application is terminated. The user comes back. The navigation stack is empty. They were just on a secondary page. Now they come back, and they're back on the first page. That totally blows. What a bad experience that is for them, especially if in order to go to the secondary page, it's several steps to get into it. Um, yep. The, uh, what's the problem? The problem is when the user returns, all their data entry lo is lost as well, right? That's a big problem. They were just filling out a form. 
filling, filling, filling. Somebody called them on Skype. They answered Skype. It launched another application. They had a one-second call and said, hey, I've got to get back to that form I'm filling out with that really cool app. Okay, so they hang up, swap back to your app. That really cool app just took them back to the main page and dumped all the, app, all of the work that you, they've done, right? So that's the second problem. Not only are they not navigated back to the page they were at before, all of the data entry that they've done is lost as well. How are you going to persist the state for them? Right? There's all kinds of logic, listening for the uh, suspended event, or we could just use Prism and let it do all of this for us. Right? This is kind of part of the candy around Prism for us. It introduces the restorable state attribute. The restorable state attribute is what I decorate the properties that I know need to be persisted across the boundary, right? So look what I've done here. I, this is a view model. See, I have on navigated two. And then right there, I have a single property of item, right? That's all that it is. But I want every single time I'm about to be terminated, which is really a suspension, because you assume terminated when you're suspending, so every time I'm suspended, I want that to be put somewhere in some sort of box later. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to do it myself. I just want to decorate this and the 15, 16 other properties that I might have inside my view model so that they persist across that lifecycle boundary. Right? I want to do it all for me, and this is what does it for me, all with the restorable state attribute. The way that it works really is the dictionary that's passed into on navigating to. When I call base dot on navigating to, all the work is magic from there. There's just really nothing else to it. All the work is magic from there, and then all the re restoration as well as the saving when the suspension begins is all automatic for me. Great. That saves me, by the way, lines and lines and lines and lines and lines of code, and all kinds of problems that come up because I dream up my own way of persisting data, and you dream up your own way of persisting data. Both of our ways work, and then we get on the same project together, and we hate each other. We won't even go to lunch anymore, because now we can't agree on how to persist data, and at least we can come here and see, here's one we know works, we know is proven, and it can be a universal approach. All right. So let's look at how to implement this. This won't take but a second. It's, uh, it's uh, really, really great. All right. So they will do this in the details page. So the details page has that item property. So all I have to do is add the decoration of the restorable state, right? The restorable state right to that, not to the field, but to the property. You'll get an error if you try to do it to the field. So it's OK. It'll fix it for me. And then now I'm going to go over to AppZaml. One more thing I need to do. Because I'm not saving a base type, I'm saving a complex type. I need to register it as a known type for serialization. That's just the way serialization works. So inside the session state service, I can say register known type. And I just make a reference to my models.item. Now, job done. Everything is finished. That's the entire logic. Everything else is handled for me automatically by the framework that I'm using. Right? So now I can load it up. This is me on the phone, navigate to the second one, and I can start typing. This is going to be the text that I lose, though, right? because what's going to happen? This is when it terminates without suspension. right? So I'm trying to fake it just by stopping the debug process. If you didn't have the logic in implemented, this is what would happen to you, basically. So I'll go back into Cyan. And when I do, you can see the text is all gone. right? But now let's use the process the way it's meant to be. So I can go in and say, this is the text uh, that will save. All right. So now I'm going to use lifecycle events. This comes with Visual Studio so I can simulate uh, suspension and shutdown, which is really what I want. So I'll go down. And I can add it, by the way, uh, to the command bar just by selecting debug location. So that's just up to you to add that so you can do it. I'll suspend and shut down. My application is no longer running. I'll run it again, which will be a resume from termination. It fixes not only the navigation stack, by the way, because it took me to the secondary page, but it also saved the data and restored that for me as well. And what did I have to do? I decorated the property that, that I needed. And because it was a complex type, I registered that type for serialization. The end of the job right there. right? Pretty simple and definitely saved me a lot of effort and angst in order to get it working just right. Don't even have to really test it anymore because I know that it works across everything because it's been tested for me. All right. Now let's talk about injection. Doing great. I'm killing it. If I got paid by the word, I'd be rich. Mm. How many people use in, in, uh, dependency injection today? 
almost all of you. I think the assumption is it's too complicated and nobody uses it. This just shows those people are dumb, right? All right. Though it's too complicated for those people. <laughs> I, that part's recorded. That's great. All right. So what's the problem? The problem is everything is creating objects and managing their state. It is so annoying that I have four, five, six view models and every single one of them is, in, is interacting or creating, in this case, remember our repository? I create that repository over and over again. What if that repository needed a key? Am I going to start passing that key over and over again? How ridiculous is that? What if, I need, what if it's expensive to create that repository? What if instead I wanted to create it one time and hold it in memory so that I don't have to keep paying the cost of creating that repository over and over? What if I wanted to cache data? Where am I going to cache it? It all makes sense to have something else create that repository for me, right? We all are on the same page together. All right. So let's talk specifically about Unity. But before we do, I want to say this. Prism doesn't require Unity. Not at all. If you're an AutoFact guy, if you're, does anybody use a different one? You, you, you do. Got it. All right. Don't yell it out. All right. So you could, but it's OK. I mean, you're in the back, so it wouldn't be right. But let's just talk about Unity for a second, because we know that Prism was made by patterns and practices, but so was Unity, right? So these are all friends with each other, but it doesn't mean yours can't be used either, and I'll show you how that, that extension would work. And it's nothing. It's so easy. All right. Uh, so first, inversion of control container, that's what Unity gives us, and it's been around for forever, right? So you can trust it. It's nice. It's performant. It works, and everything's great about it. And most importantly, it's optional. Here's what is important, right? Here are the two steps in order to really make it work. First of all, I would create the container. For me, it's just you know container equals new Unity container, and it's over, right? So that's how I create a Unity container. You would create your container using whatever it is you want, or a Unity container, right? So in initialize, which runs every time, by the way, right? That's why I use initialize. In initialize, I'll register two ways. I'll register an instance, which because I'll let's say it's for the event aggregator. The event aggregator is already created, so I don't don't need. Unity to create it for me. Just use it whenever anybody asks for an event aggregator, give them the one I've already made. But in the next line, it's register type. So in this case, I could say it's for the I item repository, and I can tell them where that concrete, concrete implementation is, and I'll let Unity build it from that point forward, right? It can go and create it. And in this case, I'll use the container controlled life uh, time manager, which is basically kind of a, it's a, it's a per, is it per instance? Yeah, it's per instance, yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, and that last line is only because it needs a task to be returned. I'm not doing any awaiting, so I always have to do that little trick with the task, right? The other thing is down here in the resolve method. In the resolve method is where the type is actually being requested. I override that because uh, out of the box it's just going to get nothing, right? Because you don't have to use a container. But uh, when it does, I'll overwrite it to say, use my container. So that underscore container inside the resolve method there is my Unity container. This is where your autofac container or your XYZ container, whatever it is you're using, would just return the correct type. Boom, you've plugged in your, your uh, inversion of control container on your own, right? Great. Everybody good? Yeah. There's some circles. All right, so let me show you uh, how to build this out. I don't know if my voice is tired or my fingers are tired. <laughs> All right, just kidding. All right, so there'll be a few, there'll be a bunch of small changes that we're going to need to make. Let's see. The, um, let's see. Sorry, I lost my mouse. Hang on. All right, <clears throat> sorry about that. So the first thing we'll need to do is create a reference to Unity itself. I'll use my NuGet manager to add it to both head projects. So there's Unity, and it'll ask me if it wants in Windows and Windows Phone, which is yes, I want it in both, right? And so I'll install it for both, and I can use it from there. And the first change that I'll need to make is inside my app XAML CS, making a quick reference now. And it doesn't have to be static, but I'll make a quick reference to the uh, to uh, creating a unity container um, field, right? So I'll call it underscore container, and I'll new it up right here because I know that I'll use it right away. So there's no reason to wait to create it. Now, in in uh, 
my on initialize is where I start registering those types. So I don't do it this way anymore. Now I use my container to do everything. So I'll register an instance. Remember iNavigation service? The iNavigation service is already created and is part of the base implementation for MVVM base. And uh, then I'll register a type. This is that repository that I want Unity to handle for me. <clears throat> Maybe I would have to do it a different way if it really was expensive or had some sort of, um, some sort of authentication. But this is going to be the simple way, so I can show you both implementations, right? So I have register instance and register type, but it, none of this will work if I don't override resolve. So I'll override resolve, and I will, I will make sure it's my container doing the resolution and creating whatever type they want. Specifically, it'll be my, my view model that they're creating here, right? So the view model will ask for a navigation service. My view model will ask for a repository. So here's my main page view model. I'm going to use constructor injection because it's the easiest and it's the cleanest. And so here's my iNavigation service is one of the things I'm going to need for my main page view model. And my uh, iItem repository is the other. Those are the only two I'm going to ask for. I'll create quick fields so I can hold them in there. And then I'll make sure that those fields get set inside my, um, inside my constructor. All right, job done. From this point forward, Unity will sniff those in the constructor and know that they're missing. I don't have to use the repository anymore. I can use whatever's passed in, which I've stored there in the, uh, in the field, right? That's great. Now I don't have to create it. I don't have to even think how is it created. Same thing with navigation. I can use the navigation service. And in the, in the open command, I'll do the same thing and create a, uh, I'll just use the, the navigation service field. Those are all passed in. I can trust and assume that they're going to be there thanks to the way that I create things now with Unity instead, right? Uh, so now in the details page, I'm going to need to do the same thing. It does a couple of things. It uses the navigation service, but it also uses my uh, repository as well, so I'll add them both and put a field so that they all get stored. So there's the navigation service. Let me add the, let me update the command to use the navigation service that I just created. And now, should have added them both at the same time. Here we go. So now I'll just add another. And by the way, I could keep going on and on and on. And as long as I've registered these with Unity, it'll continue to inject these properly, right? So here's the repository. I'll make this sure that the repository field gets propagated or gets populated. And then I don't need the new up repository. I'll just use the one that was passed in to me. And now I've injected all the data that I want, right? So that's, that's a huge win. Let's, let's just look and see how it works. Really no coding changes, no logic changes, just coding changes to make sure I don't new up the repository, that it gets newed up for me, right? So everything works properly. And if I back out, back out it'll work in uh, phone and Windows both, right? Great. Great. OK. So there's no getting around it. Constructor injection is the simplest form of injection, right? Because all I have to do is go into my view model and I'll, uh, yes, in my view model and add a new item in my constructor and say, and I need this, and I need this, and I need this, and I need this. And as long as I'm uh, diligent to make sure that those are registered inside Unity, uh, those will always be given to me automatically by the system and I can interact with them however I want, controlling their construction on the, uh, in a central location, right? So that's great. In that resolve, by the way, I just did underscore container dot resolve, but you might need an if statement in there, that if you're asking for this, it's going to be done like this, but everything else uses a, a basic resolve. Whatever it is you want to use. You can create a factory around it, whatever it is you need. All right, <clears throat> that's injection. I've never spoken so fast or so short about injection, but it's an important part, but not probably the most important part. But it's certainly an important practice for you to have in order to ha get your arms around all the code that's going on and kind of minimize the logic that's going on that it's repeating. So the next is messaging. So what's the problem? The problem is classes can't communicate with, with each other without references, referencing each other. Well, that makes plenty of sense, right? How, is a, how am I going to be able to uh, set a property? How am I going to be able to raise an event? If I try to set a property in another class, I have to have reference to that class. If that class wants to react to my event, it has to have reference to me. That's the way it works, right? And then I do a plus equals. Well, that's a serious problem. Let's pretend that you and I, <clears throat> let's pretend that you and I have a string between us, right? So that's the reference that we have, a string between us right now. now uh, you have just been moved, I navigated away from you, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. I navigated away from you, and it's actually time for all the memory that you're consuming to be put back 
and made available in the heap again. So a garbage collector comes around and is about to collect you. And as a garbage collector arrives and looks at you, it says, now wait a minute, you've got a string up there to Jerry. That string is important. I will never collect this garbage. Sorry, you're not garbage. I will never collect this awesome guy with, uh, un until there's no string to anything. Right? So as long as I have a strong reference to something, as long as you have a strong reference to something, garbage collection will leave you in memory no matter what. Even if I've navigated away, even if I've set you to null, even if I've, there's so many things that I could do that you would think would make it so that you move out of memory, but you really never do and garbage collection can't do it. This is a common source of memory leaks in applications where they create a plus equal reference uh, so they can handle an event. And from that point forward, it just grows and grows and grows. So imagine that in my secondary page, it created some sort of handler that, that made it so it couldn't be collected. And then I go back and I go to the next color. And then I go back and I go to the next color. And I do it 20 times. The memory footprint of a single page is now 20 times inside a, up in memory, right? So this is what we're trying to solve. And we solve it with messaging, right? We solve it with messaging from, from, from uh, the patterns and practices team. Again. There are other uh, aggravate, aggr ag aggravators. There are other aggregators out there, uh, but uh, this is the way this one works. All right. So messaging instead of events is the idea. So in order to first to set it up, I use the event aggregator, which is we'll add this together. It's the pub sub events event aggregator that comes from patterns and practices, and I get the event, and it's a strongly typed event. This is important because I might want to pass things around inside this event. I might want to pass a new value, which is what I'll demo. But then again, it might be actually a click event. And you want to pass the entire uh, event arguments over to the user. That's great. You can totally do that because it's a strongly typed message. And so then I subscribe to it. So you see the dot subscribe is a lot different than a plus equals because it creates a weak reference for me. So we had that strong reference, which was the string. But a weak reference is really just more of a verbal contract. You know, you could just vanish at any time. And so then it has a handler, and that's the handler down there. And it looks and feels like a real event handler from that point forward. Or I could use a delegate up there inside the describe uh, property. All right, so subscribe is the trick. There's also a publish. And that publish allows me to send it off. And so think of it, this is important too. So I might be, a, I'm up here right now, constantly sending out messages, right? And all of you are receiving. And to be honest, I don't know all of you. In fact, I don't even know if half of you are listening, but half of you probably are. And so as I say it, you receive it, but I don't get acknowledgement of that. I don't have any kind of connection. So that sort of broadcast publishing is also what's given to me by messaging as well. I can just publish, and I don't know if anybody's listening or not. I don't have to check to see if it's null when I publish. I don't ask if it's two, three, four people that are listening. Everybody could be listening. I just publish out my message. There could be a subscription everywhere, right? Or nowhere, and it doesn't matter to me. It matters. I didn't mean it like that. All right. All right. So let's implement, uh, let's implement messaging using pub sub events. So the first thing is to go to NuGet. We're going to need to go get pub sub events. It's easy to find because it's made by patterns and practices, so you know you have the right one. So I'll use 1.1.2, which is an update that 1.1.1 uh, had a small little tweak in it, so now everything's good again. And uh, just to make this work, <laughs> <laughs> what, what's that? What's that you say? What's that, what's that you say? What? That seems weird. All right, just to make this work, I'm going to add a property to the main page view model. So we'll start with the interface. It's just going to be a simple value. And so the value is um, just going to, so we can publish out something. I'll publish out a value. It'll just be numeric. So I'll implement this here in the runtime view model. I'll make sure that it implements I notify property change so it'll update the UI for me of value. But I'll also, um, also set it up so that when I subscribe to it, it's going to be strongly typed. I'll create a message, message uh, folder. And here's my message. It's going to be new value. That's all. And I'll use pub sub events. And it's going to be called a pub sub event. And it'll ask me, because it's generic, what type I'm going to be passing as a payload. In this case, it's just an integer. Remember that value created? We're just going to match those up. There's nothing else to do inside a message, by the way. That's just a definition so that I have it. I'll go inside my, run, my design time view model just so I can have an implementation of value. Remember, it's just an integer. 
and so I just call it value. There's really nothing to do there either. It has a default value of zero, so I don't even have to set a default value to it. All right, so back to my runtime view model, I need to subscribe to it, but the way I'm going to subscribe to it is through the event aggregator, which I don't have a reference to. So just like in our previous demo, I'm going to quickly just add that to my, uh, to my uh, constructor and make sure that, I, that it's set up. So I, even though it's not set yet, I know that I'll, I'll set it up properly. So here it is. Uh, event aggregator, I'll get the specific event that I know that I want, right? It's going to be message. It's going to be new value. And when I subscribe to it, I can just set up with that handler and let the refactoring tool do it for me. So there's my handle event. What am I going to do? Whatever its payload is, I'll set to it the proper, that new property I created. And I'll just make sure it has a nice parameter name. All right. Um, the, I still need to go and uh, make sure that you can visually see this. I don't want to do this in the debugger. The easiest place is probably in the header of the hub section. So I'll go just set the header of the hubs. I'll bind it. And because it's already in the view model, the iView model, I know it's there. So I can set it to value. See, its default was zero. But I'll show you here when it's running. Now, we don't have any kind of registration for this uh, event aggregator. So I'll create a field where it gets held, because I only want one event aggregator because it has to be a singleton, right? Because I, I want to make sure it's, uh, it's referenced properly. All right, so inside my container, I'll go ahead and reference this time an instance of I event aggregator passing in my, uh, the instance that I just created in the field. Now I have my event, um, my event aggregator ready to go, but I don't actually have any data being published. So we'll just do this with a timer. That's easy enough. So I'll set up a timer. I'll use a dispatcher timer. Every second, I'm going to update that value. It doesn't have any reference, remember, to the view, the view model, or anything else. So in the tick, every one second, all I'm going to do is publish a new message that says the value has been changed. So it'll be message.new value. And the only thing it's going to say in my pub, no, no, no. All it's going to say in my publish is what, va what the number is going to be. And instead of using random, I'll just say whatever the ticks are this current date time. It's simple as that, right? It's not that big of a deal. And so I'll run it. Hang on just a second. <laughs> Don't do that. Uh, and, uh, all right, so now it's publishing, and the, uh, as the event gets heard, it updates the view model, even though the app XAML doesn't do anything, even though the app XAML doesn't, do any, doesn't know anything about my view or my view model. Works the exact same way if I go over to Windows Phone. I'll come back to you, though. Hang on. just. And uh, inside Windows Phone, remember, it's the same XAML and the same view model, so it works the same way as well. What's your question? Uh, so the question was whether or not it's thread safe. Um, it's not thread safe because it's all being, well, I'm sorry. This is probably thread safe in the way that you would use it, yes, because it all starts on the UI thread. If that were a timer that wasn't on the UI thread, it would still be thread safe. So it is thread. So yes, it's thread safe. The way I did it kind of faked it to make it different. I don't know if that makes sense. So the way I did it made it easy, right, because I'm using a dispatcher timer. But you might use this from a background process that's doing something else on a different thread. And if it is, it's still thread safe because of the way it's published. Because the publisher already lists sniffs for the dispatcher for you. you know, it's pretty nice. It's pretty nice. It kind of saves the, <laughs> save the hassle. Sorry. The, um, all right. So just as a reminder, the reason we use messaging in the first time, place is because uh, strong references stop garbage collection. We want garbage collection because that's how we reduce our memory footprint. Right? That's really important. All right, just got a couple seconds more. I want to talk to you about the, the, the guidance around PRISM. And it's probably something like you've never seen anywhere else. So I can go on to MSDN and search for PRISM for Windows Runtime. And I can download this 240-page book that describes in exquisite detail all of the guidance that I just described to you and so much more. Going through design pr practices, going through UI guidance, going through whether or not how many buttons you should use, where they should be, how things should be laid out, the way your code should work. There probably is no better guidance. In fact, PRISM is our most comprehensive guidance period. Right? There's no getting around it. PRISM is a framework for sure, but it's also a set of documents. And it's also a set of reference implementations you can download and look at yourself. Right. They're really fantastic. So if you're thinking, I'm starting totally as a green field, and I wonder where to go from here, this is your solution. 
This is more information than you're, one gonna, you're even want, just to be honest, right? You're going to start skimming about 200 pages in, trust me. And uh, a lot of that is a, is a walkthrough, step by step, of the reference implementations as well. PRISM really is the, uh, the most comprehensive guidance that we have. And uh, the idea around guidance, remember, isn't that it's set in stone. It's just meant to give you a place to start. And you can follow it 100% unless you have a good reason not to. So just know that you have the flexibility to go anywhere you want. But this gives you somewhere to go if you don't have any idea. All right, so looking back, we talked about PRISM. And it's just its basic implementation, all the way to using Unity, using messaging, and then into the documentation that we give you as well inside PRISM. You can find all the source code on CodePlex. So you can download every line and step through it if you're not sure how it works or you want to know, as well as get all the docs here as, as well. Um, perfect. All right, well, thank you, everybody. I want to say that uh, at xaml.codeplex.com, I'll put all the source code here. That's probably the first question that's going to be asked. So I'll, this, it's not up there just yet, but I'll zip it all together and put it up there tonight so that you guys can go there and download it as well. My previous session, the same thing. I just forgot to put this slide in my deck so I could show you guys that, uh, that where the code was as well. So it's all up at xaml.codeplex.com. Every time I speak, I put my code, up, my code up there. Every time I blog, I put my code up there. There's a lot of code up there. So if you're into XAML and you're wanting a lot of source code and samples, it's all up there. A lot of candy, too. A lot of fun things as well. All right, my name's Jerry Nixon. You can stay around as long as you want if you have questions. Thanks for listening.